I'm Cape Jewel, and this is Comic Smack, your weekly, daily, all the time, anytime comic show where I give you your fix, everything you need to know from the world of comic books and superheroes. And on today's show, we are taking a closer look at Defenders issue number two. Luke Cage was almost knocked off by Diamondback, and now he's gunning for the rest of the team. Can they overcome? Well, let's hop on in together and find out, shall we? All right, then. So as we join the comic, Jessica Jones is rushing to the night hospital to see what happened to her husband, Luke Cage. Linda Carter, the night nurse and not the TV actress, gets us up to speed, saying that Luke was poisoned in his fight with Diamondback. And it wasn't any normal poison, either. It was a super advanced shield poison one probably used for knocking off dignitaries. Jess is mad that Luke would so stupidly go to battle Diamond back on his own, but at the same time, she can't really blame him. She would do the same if the tables were turned. Perhaps the strangest part of these events, though, is that it's Black Cat who actually dropped Luke off at the hospital, showing that despite being a kingpin of crime, maybe there's just a sliver of good still left in old Felicia. And hey, speaking of familiar faces, and I totally was, an antidote is dropped off at the hospital in a great cameo by Blade the Vampire, Hunter, looking completely different than he did back in his last Deadpool appearance, but hey, who cares, it's Wesley Snipes. Jess also wants some information on where Diamondback might be hiding out, but Carter is sure to say, damn it, Jess, I'm a doctor, not an informant. That's okay, though, because Danny Rand Iron Fist has gone full-on Bruce Wayne and infiltrated a high-class New York party that is being attended by none other than Wilson Fist the Kingpin. Kingpin, you might not know if you didn't read his excellent and criminally undersold miniseries, he's actually started to try and go straight right now. Iron Fist uses this to his advantage, saying that if I was Diamondback and I was making a play for the New York underworld to become the new kingpin, then I think a great message could be sent by killing the old one. This leaves Old Fist with precious few options. Either he can knock off Diamondback now or wait for him to come and kill him. Either way, he loses his spot at the top of legitimate society. It's with that, though, he opts to send the heroes on their way to where Diamondback is hit out at Get this, Club Ultimate. Oh, Brian Michael Bendis, you tricksy little hobbit, you dropping references to the Ultimate Universe wherever you can. Old Willis is slowly but surely beginning to regret he didn't watch Luke Cage die. Oh, why did I have to do the cliche villain thing, poison him and just assume he died? That's what we call in writing lampshade hanging. Brian Michael Bendis is a huge fan of it, and here it works out. It's at this point Jess comes barging in on the warpath looking for some payback with Diamondback, and she manages to connect one right on his jaw. Not far behind her is Daredevil, who got some great information from his contact, Ben Urich. And lastly, Iron Fist himself. Now, you would assume in a three-on-one fight, Diamondback hasn't a chance, right? He's just a normal dude. He can't fight off three super-powered individuals. But that's where you would be dead wrong. It would seem that whatever mysterious process brought Willis back from the dead also managed to gift him with superpowers of his own. One of which would seem to be disappearing without a trace, which is exactly what what he does outside. Even Daredevil can't track him with his super senses. Yeah, all in all, it looks like the Defenders can't get more embarrassed, and this is just their second night on the job. And then things get a whole lot worse when they all get tranked in the neck by the Punisher. Oh, hey, Frank, did you hear they were having a Netflix-adjacent Marvel superhero party and you'd wondered where your invite got lost? So, that was Defenders number two, everyone, and overall, I think it stands as another great example of what Brian Michael Bendis is capable of when he's really well-suited for the material, really enjoys the character and is more or less in his street-level wheelhouse. Dialogue is sharp, characters are a lot of fun, there's a lot of really interesting interactions and Easter eggs and walk-ons, not just Blade, Paladin was hanging out in the night hospital too, and I'm a big Paladin fan. I also dig how even though this is a team book, the Defenders aren't officially a team just yet, they're working the same case, but they're all working it from different angles, and they all end up with the same information and all end up coming to the same place at the end. Ben Yurik is actually used pretty well in this issue too, instead of a recap page, you just get Ben recapping the events of the previous issue. I thought that was a really nice touch. Then, of course, there's Marquez's art, and really, what can you say about Marquez's art that I haven't said already? It's friggin' beautiful. It's friggin' gorgeous. It looks great. I know we're already on issue two, but if they can keep up this level of quality, Defenders is hitting all my right buttons and quickly becoming one of my favorite things to read each week, which is why I give it an 8.5 out of 10. Super solid. So, there's your team book action for the week, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it, and while I have your attention, why not check out some of these other videos I've worked on from up the week. You'll also find links to all my social media pages on screen and down in the description below. While you're there, you'll also find links to my Patreon page. Patrons get exclusive access to videos and podcasts before anyone else, and they can do so for as little as a dollar a month. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I will see you all in another video.